Hi there, making your first, fifth or even tenth YouTube video can seem so hard, like pushing a giant rock uphill in the rain. You might even give up before you find out how life-changing YouTube could be. By the end of this video, you'll know how to make making your next 100 videos faster, more fun and easier, and even help you get closer to going full-time on YouTube if that's what you want. We're going to be covering all of these things, and this video is organised into three parts. I've also added chapters to help you get around more easily, and if you want to re-watch certain parts, you can just go straight to that chapter. Let's start at the very beginning and that's how to get ideas for your YouTube videos and also how to use storytelling to keep the viewer hooked. Step one in this three-step process to work on ideas for your YouTube channel is to identify sources. What I mean by that is that inspiration can come from anywhere really and at any time but there's three main places that you can look for ideas for your next video. The first is YouTube itself. Look at other channels that are in the same niche as you and take inspiration from them, but don't just copy the videos. Try to add some extra value or maybe make them shorter or longer or just inject your own sense of style and personality into the video that you make. The second huge source that you can use for ideas for your YouTube video is to use what you know or what you're an expert in or what you're known for. For example, if you're a real estate agent, you've got a lot of knowledge and experience that you could share with other people on your YouTube channel. Or for example, if you're a programmer, you're going to have loads of knowledge that you can share and use all of the aspects of a programming language and make loads of videos on all these different aspects of programming. The third source that can be an unexpected goldmine for ideas for your YouTube videos is to read books. Read books both related to the niche that you're in and also books that aren't related to the niche you're in. Quite often you can get a cross-pollination of ideas that can spark some really good YouTube ideas. Also don't be afraid to read fiction or poetry because that can kind of get the artistic juices flowing sometimes. Step two to this overall process is to make sure you capture ideas. You never know when inspiration is going to strike so make sure you've always either got a notebook on you or a note taking app on your phone that you can quickly open and write down an idea if it comes into your brain. If you don't write the idea down straight away, there's a massive chance that it's just going to be forgotten and you'll be thinking, what was that great idea I had? If you write it down, you're never going to lose it. Also, related to writing ideas down, just write down every single idea you have. Don't try and filter out the ideas as to whether or not they're good or would make good videos. Write every single one down, get it out of your brain, and then we'll use those ideas in the third step I'll talk about in just a minute. You can periodically go through those ideas and organize them and delete any ideas that you actually don't think were any good, but don't try and do that in the moment of creating that idea in your brain. Step three of this overall process is to evaluate and prioritize. What you wanna do is take this list of ideas that you've got and give each one a score from one to 10 on how valuable that idea is potentially going to be for your target audience. It doesn't matter whether the type of content you make is entertainment or education or inspirational content. Just think about the idea and how much value the viewer will get from it. Next, go through all of your ideas again and give them another score from one to 10 on how excited you are and how interested you are in actually making that video yourself. Next, go through all of the ideas again, give them another score from one to 10 on how much competition there is for that particular idea. Once you've given all of your ideas a score in each of those three categories, add up the total score for each idea. Each idea is going to have a score from 3 to 30. The ideas with the highest score are most likely to be the videos you should make next. They're going to be valuable to the viewer, they're going to be enjoyable to make, and they're not going to have as much competition on YouTube as some of the other ideas. The idea is just the start though. You're going to want to plan it out and work out the flow or the story that you can use to keep viewers interested in watching it from start to finish. Doing this is going to give you better watch time for your video and it's more likely to send a signal to YouTube to push it out to more people. Let me share with you three tips next on how to use storytelling to keep the viewer interested throughout the entire video and also how to get an overall better flow in your video. Tip number one is to think about state change. What do you want your viewer to feel or rather what do you want to be the change in feelings from when the viewer starts watching the video to when the viewer finishes watching the video. For example a viewer might click on one of your videos to learn something but by the end of that video they're feeling super confident and super motivated and super fired up to try whatever you've 
you've taught them, they've got an overall sense of positivity for the future. Or for example, they start watching a video feeling a bit demotivated and down, but by the end of watching your video, they're feeling more positive about the future. That's a really powerful thing. Feelings are really powerful, so ask yourself how you want the viewer to feel at the end of your video. Tip two is to think about classic storytelling techniques. It doesn't matter whether you're making educational content, entertainment, documentaries, or narrative films, weaving in a story is gonna help your viewers to feel more motivated to keep watching it because they wanna find out what's going to happen. There's a lot of different ways to structure or tell a story, such as the three-act structure, the five-act structure, or the concept of the hero's journey. A lot of these things have a lot of things in common, so what I've done is I've simplified it and broken it down into seven phases. Phase one is the starting state. This is the status quo or where things are boring or predictable or safe. Phase two is often referred to as the inciting incident, and it's something that disturbs that starting state in phase one and creates a problem or a goal that's going to need to be solved, such as taking the ring to Mordor. Phase three is often referred to as the refusal of the call. This is where yourself or the character in the film is kind of doubting themselves and not wanting to go on the journey to solve the problem that was raised in the inciting incident. For example, if you're making some kind of outdoor adventure video, you might be standing at the bottom of the mountain looking up and expressing your doubts or your fears and not really wanting to go on the journey. Next comes phase four. This is the decision where yourself or the character decides to actually go on the journey and accept the call. It's the gathering of friends and resources and planning the journey and then setting out on that journey. Phase five is really the meat of the story. It's the journey to get to that end goal or achieve whatever you're setting out to achieve. The important thing in phase five though is there's gotta be some obstacles along the way that get overcome. These obstacles add a sense of tension to the story and if things are too easy, then really people aren't that interested in watching. Phase six is the peak moment. It's the achieving of the goal or the objective. For example, if you were making a hiking video, you could have a hero drone shot of you standing on top of the peak. Or if you've got a baking YouTube channel, it could be that final amazing decorated cake after hours and hours of working on it. Or if you've got a landscape photography channel, it could be after hours of walking through a forest, you finally find the perfect composition of a tree. Phase seven is the denouement or the aftermath of what's happened. It's kind of wrapping things up in a nice bow, tying up any loose ends, and also maybe giving a hint at what's next for you or the character. Basically, it's concluding things so the viewer actually feels satisfied with the ending, unlike a lot of films I seem to be watching at the minute which don't really have an ending and kind of make you wish you hadn't bothered watching them. The third tip is to actually make a shot list and or storyboard. Before we get into that, please subscribe and turn on notifications if you like this kind of video, I'd really appreciate it. So once you've got an idea for your story and maybe you've gone through those seven phases of storytelling, grab yourself a bit of paper and start to write down the shots or the locations that can help you tell that story. For example, you might want to start the video with a wide angle shot or perhaps a drone shot to show where the video is taking place and kind of show off that starting state that we talked about in phase one. This list of camera shots can really help to visualize what your final video is going to look like before you even press record. It can also help you save time on mistakes from filming the wrong things. You can go one step further and actually create a storyboard where you just sketch out what these different shots will look like. You don't have to be a great artist, trust me, I'm not one. You can even just use stick figures and arrows if you want to. A storyboard is going to give you a better idea of if your story will flow in the final edit. If you want to learn more about planning YouTube videos, I actually wrote a short ebook which I'll put a link to down in the description. Now that you've chosen your idea and you've planned out the story or the flow for that idea, you can get to recording. In this part two, we're going to look at how to get cinematic looking videos, how to use microphones so you're not relying on the usually rubbish built-in microphones in cameras or smartphones, where to position your camera when you're filming yourself and also how to be more comfortable and confident on camera. So let's kick off part two by looking at a foolproof lighting setup you can use. Three-point lighting or triangle lighting as it's sometimes known as like you can see in this shot uses three main light sources, a key light, a fill light and a backlight, sometimes known as a rim light or a hair light. If you make the time to learn this technique then you'll always be able to get a great looking shot so make sure you watch this video to the end. So three-point lighting is used to light a person or an object. It's different from lighting an entire room or a space. Once you've learned this technique you can use it as a solid foundation which you can then add or take 
away from to get the look that you want. For example, you could decide just to use the key light or just the backlight or add even more light to the setup. It doesn't matter what lights you use, whether they're expensive or budget lights, you can use this technique to get great looking shots. If you're interested in what lights I'm using in this exact setup, I'll put them in the video description. And I'll also put together a little package of budget lights if you wanna try this look out for yourself. So you can see at the minute, this side of my face is the brightest. That's because the key light is shining on it. This side of my face is not in complete darkness, however, because the fill light is on that side, filling in the shadows. And at the back of my head and shoulders here, you can see a glow, that's the backlight. Let me show you what each of these lights look like on their own. This is what the shot looks like with just that backlight on. This is what it looks like with just the fill light on. This is what it looks like with just the key light and the backlight, but no fill. And this is what it looks like with just the key light on. The key light is not any specific make or model of light. The word key just describes its position in the three point lighting setup. It's the key light or the most important light in this setup. The key light is usually the brightest light in the three point lighting setup. And you can see just by using the key light on its own, we've got quite a moody look to this shot. So while you can just use a key light on its own, it's not always the most flattering look for a face. The key light gets pointed towards the subject either in front and to the left or in front and to the right. Currently it's to the left there and it can be anywhere from about 25 degrees to 70 degrees to the side of a subject. If you're just starting out put the light about at a 45 degree angle from the subject. See how that looks and then experiment with moving it further left or further right. When it comes to the height of the key light it's usually positioned either at eye level or tilted above eye level. If you put it below the subject shining upwards it's going to look really unnatural and a bit like a horror movie. That's because we're using to seeing other humans with light coming from above them such as the sun or the moon or ceiling lights. Once you've got your key light in position you can turn it on and set the brightness so you get the exposure that you want on this side of the face. You can then go and turn on the fill light which we're going to do now. The shot now looks a lot more approachable and friendly and a bit less sinister. You can still get a more moody look even when you are using a fill light by reducing the brightness of the fill light. Let's just go do that. So I've dropped that fill light down from 35% power output to 10% power output. And this side of the face is now a lot darker, giving us a more moody look. If I actually increase that brightness to more than what it was when we started, so this is with the fill light set to 50% now, which means this side of the face is gonna be a lot brighter with a lot less shadow. Let's just set it back to what we had originally, which was 35%. So now it looks somewhere in between those two extremes. Basically, you get to choose how bright you want your fill light to be, depending on the mood that you're going for. The closer the brightness of the fill light gets to the brightness of the key light, the more flat the shot's going to look, and you'll see a lot less shadows on the face. People always think about light, but it's actually the shadows that give us a 3D look. At the minute, this shot looks okay, but it's a bit two-dimensional, and it looks a bit video-like and not very movie-like. We can actually fix that and make it look more three-dimensional by adding in the backlight. Now with that backlight turned on you can see that I'm standing out from the background more. It gives the whole shot a sense of depth and 3D feeling. Both the key light and the fill light have got diffusion on at the minute which is softening the light falling on my face. The backlight however doesn't have any diffusion, it's a hard light source. You can of course add diffusion to the backlight if you want to. When you're using a backlight be careful that it doesn't shine into the camera lens otherwise you're going to get lens flare and loss of contrast. To prevent this you can use some black material to kind of shield the backlight from the camera or use some barn doors on the light to shape where the light is falling. The great thing about the backlight that I'm using at the minute is that it has a built-in floodlight spotlight control. That means you can narrow the beam angle down so it doesn't spread out and accidentally go into the camera lens. By the way, if this is the first time we're meeting, welcome, I'm Jason and this channel is all about making better looking, better sounding and better edited video. If that's something that would be useful to you, please subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. One of the biggest challenges of using a backlight is how to get it behind and pointing down at the subject without the light or any light stands appearing in the frame. In this shot here, I'm using a C-stand with plenty of sandbags on the base and a baby boom arm counterbalanced with another sandbag. However you set up your lights, make sure they're 100% safe and secure and they're not going to fall. At the minute, I've got this back light set up directly behind me, but if you want to, you can move it off to one side, have it pointing down at the subject's head and shoulders in the direction of the fill light, for example. If you've got a backlight where you can change the color temperature, like 
like the one I'm using here, you can change the color of the backlight to give you a bit more color contrast or color separation. So now you know how to set up great looking lighting, but there's no point in having really nice lighting if people can't hear what you say because of rubbish audio. The microphones built into most cameras or smartphones don't sound the best. If you want to make the best possible videos, you're going to need to level up your audio game. You can do this in a few different ways, like trying to reduce the amount of echo in the room where you're filming, or learning how to use the sound editing tools in your video editing software. But one of the best ways to improve your audio is actually to use some kind of external microphone for your camera or smartphone. There's a lot of different microphones you can choose from. Some use cables to connect to the camera or phone, and some use wireless transmission like this one I'm wearing right now. I've been using this system for ages now. It gives great sounding audio, and the benefit of a wireless system is that you can move around and really make your videos more interesting because you don't have to stand straight in front of the camera where the microphone is. Let's see next how to set up and use this wireless microphone system. So this is the bag that the microphone system comes in. Inside this bag, We've got the charging case. You get a couple of these little wind muffs and you get an audio cable. Let's start off by taking a look at this charging case. To charge this case, it's got a USB-C connector. You just plug that into a USB charger. And if we open this up, everything lights up to start with. It's telling us the battery of this transmitter, the battery level of this transmitter, and these 0.6 hours and 1.0 hours, they're not the battery life remaining. That's how much internal recording space is left. I'll get to internal recording later in this video. On the front here, you've got LEDs that tell you how much battery life is actually within this case. So the case has a battery in it, and also there's batteries in the transmitters and the receiver. So you can actually charge the DJI mic from the battery case itself, or you can plug USB cables into each of the three items separately if you want to charge them that way. You'll know when the case is full of charge because all of these lights will light up. So let's start off by looking at the receiver itself. Once you take it out of the box, the display is going to change. You've got a power button, hold that in for a few seconds and it will turn on. We've got the USB-C port for charging and also for updating firmware. We've got the output sound port. This is what you connect up to your camera's microphone. And you've also got a headphone monitoring port. You can plug a pair of headphones into here if you want to monitor the audio that's being recorded. Let's take a look at the display itself. So the top part of the screen indicates the status of the receiver. At the top left, it tells you your current recording mode. You can choose between stereo, mono, and mono with safety track. We'll cover those in just a minute. This value tells you the current receiver gain setting. The receiver gain is how much the receiver itself amplifies the volume before it sends it along the cable to the camera. We currently don't have a headphone connected, but if we did, we'd see a little headphone icon here. Here we can see the strength of the signal between transmitter one and the receiver. And here we can see the strength of the signal between transmitter two and the receiver. If you've only got one transmitter connected, then you're only going to get one set of this information. Here you can see the battery level of the receiver itself. Then in the middle of the screen, we've got status information about the transmitters themselves. Here you can see the transmitter gain for transmitter one and the transmitter gain for transmitter two. The transmitter gain is the amplification that happens inside the transmitters themselves. So whether you've got a lav mic connected or you're using the internal microphones, it's how much that signal gets amplified before it gets sent to the receiver. Currently, we've got this receiver set up for the mono with safety track feature, but we can change that. To operate the touchscreen here, swipe down from the top to access the menu, and then you can swipe left and right to find the different items. We'll look at all of these in a second. You can choose the recording mode here. We're gonna change this from safety channel, and we're gonna change this to stereo. I'll explain what the different items are in just a minute. Swipe up from the bottom to go back a menu item, and up from the bottom to get back to the main screen. Now that we've got stereo recording mode selected, you can see the left and right indicators here. It's telling us that this transmitter is going to be output to the left side of the stereo signal, and the audio from transmitter two will be output to the right hand side of the stereo signal. You can also see the battery status of both transmitters here. They're both currently fully charged. The bottom of the receiver screen shows you the real time volume information. So you can see as I'm talking, these volume meters are going up and down. If I bring one of these transmitters really close to my lips here and keep talking, notice that the bar is going yellow and also a bit red at the end. If you start to see red, that means that your volume settings are set too loud and your audio is going to sound pretty terrible. So keep these bars in the green and occasionally popping into the yellow. So currently neither of these transmitters is muted 
muted, which means that the audio is being transmitted from them to the receiver and will ultimately get recorded in the video file. You can mute the transmitter signal from either the transmitters or using the receiver. So to access the settings for one of the transmitters, if you've got two attached, you swipe up either from the bottom left or the bottom right, depending on which transmitter you want to change. So I'm gonna swipe up from the right bottom here and now we get access to transmitter 2 settings. We can currently see that transmitter 2 is recording internally to the internal memory. If I tap this, internal recording will stop. And if I tap that again, this transmitter is now recording internal audio again. If you want to mute one of these transmitters, tap the little speaker, you get a line through it. And if I just swipe down from the top, you can see now this icon is telling us that this transmitter is muted. And you can see we're getting no volume information on this bar. If I just swipe up from the bottom right again, Tap it again to unmute. If you want to access this transmitter settings, swipe up from the bottom left. This icon here tells you how much internal recording space is left on the transmitter. All right, let's take a look at all of the settings that we can access in this receiver. Swipe down from the top to the bottom, and then you can swipe left and right to access all of these things. The first setting that you can choose from is the recording mode. Currently, this is set to stereo. What this means is that each transmitter will send its signal to the receiver, and on the left side of the stereo signal in the video file, you'll get all of the audio from transmitter one, and on the right side, you'll get all of the audio from transmitter two. If I tap this to change it, when we're using stereo mode, we've got this additional setting. We can choose whether transmitter one goes on the left or the right. Currently, transmitter one's on the left, transmitter two on the right. If I tap this, it switches over. Now transmitter one will be on the right side of the stereo signal. Transmitter two will be on the left. To change the recording mode, just tap this icon here. Now we've changed it to mono mode. Mono recording mode means that the audio from both transmitters is merged together in the receiver before it gets sent to the camera. Basically, what this means is that when you try and edit the video, you won't be able to edit the audio from transmitter one separate from the audio from transmitter two. Obviously, if you're only using one transmitter, this doesn't really matter. The third mode that you can choose is mono with safety track. This mode still records a stereo signal, but on one channel, you've got the normal volume and on the second channel you've got a copy of the audio but at a slightly lower volume. What that means is that if you've accidentally set the recording levels too high and the recording levels have overloaded or clipped you might be able to recover them in the editing process by switching to the safety track. One downside of this approach is it's still going to be a mono signal so if you're using both transmitters both of the audio from the transmitters is going to get merged before it gets sent to the camera. You won't be able to edit the left and right or transmitter one and two audio signals separately if you use this mode. This is the mode I use all the time when I'm just using one transmitter and recording myself because it gives you that extra level of safety. To get back to the main menu, swipe up from the bottom and that will go up one level. Let's take a look at this next item, receiver gain. Just tap that. The receiver gain is how much this receiver box amplifies the signal before it gets sent down the audio cable to the camera. Currently, this is set to plus six dB. Swipe to the left to reduce it. You can reduce it all the way down to negative 12 dB if the signal is overloading your camera. And on the other end of the spectrum, you can alter this all the way up to plus 12 dB if your signal in your camera is really, really quiet and you need to boost the volume. So if we set this to plus nine dB, I'll just swipe up from the bottom a couple of times. You can see we've got this plus nine now in the receiver display telling us the receiver gain setting. Let's just go back to the menu by swiping down. The next item you can change is the volume level for the headphones. We currently don't have any headphones connected, but you can increase or reduce the headphone volume there. The next set of settings is all to do with the transmitters. If I tap this, and go into these settings. The first setting you can enable or disable is the low cut setting. It's currently off, but you can switch it to on if you want to. The low cut will reduce some of those lower level frequencies if you're finding that you've got a bit of an annoying low level rumble in the bottom. For example, sometimes people turn this on to get rid of air conditioning noise or that kind of traffic rumble, but I tend to turn it off all the time and I just use the EQ features of whatever editing program I'm using. The next setting for the transmitters is the transmitter gain. If I tap this, this is where we can set how much the audio is amplified in the transmitters themselves. Currently, both transmitters are being amplified by plus 4 dB. You can change this by tapping on one of them and altering it. And you can change these independently. This is useful if you've got these transmitters attached to two different people. You could have one person that talks very softly, so you might want to increase the transmitter gain for that person, but the other person might talk very loudly. So in that case, you'd want to reduce the transmitter gain for that person. 
The next option we can choose is this Rec Stop Lock, which is not very descriptive. I just tap this. This enables you to lock the button on the transmitters that will turn off internal recording. This is a good feature to have turned on, and this will stop you from accidentally turning internal recording off by hitting the record button here. Swipe across to the next feature. This is the auto recording option. Currently this is turned on. So what that means is when you turn on one of these receivers, it will automatically start recording to the internal memory. This is a great feature to have turned on all the time in my opinion, because it's always gonna make sure you're recording a backup version of the audio inside the transmitter. You can of course turn this off if you want to. Next setting is this vibration notification. And this basically allows you to turn off the vibrate feature on the transmitters. Notice for all of these transmitter settings, you can't actually change them independently for each transmitter. The settings apply to both transmitters. The next option is to change the LED brightness. You can see that you've got a red and green light on these transmitters. This setting allows you to alter the brightness. It's currently set to low brightness. Let's change this to high. You can see how they light up even more. Or if you find these distracting or you're wearing it under clothing and it's showing through, you might want to turn these off. Personally, I usually leave this on low as it's a good middle ground. That's all of the settings for the transmitters. To get back to the main menu, swipe up from the bottom and then we'll come across here to these general system settings. Let's go and have a look at these. Out of the box, the transmitters will come automatically linked with the receiver, but you can use this option if you want to manually relink them. For example, you might replace one of the transmitters and have to relink it. The next item you can change is this brightness setting. This changes the brightness on the receiver screen. Because I live in Australia where there's a lot of bright days, I usually leave this maxed out. You can change the language. You can change the date and time. This is the date and time that gets recorded into the internal audio files. You can reset the system by doing a factory reset, which I'm not going to do at the minute. And if you want to find out what version of firmware you've got installed, you can tap this. It'll tell you the firmware version of the receiver and also the firmware versions of transmitter one and transmitter two. You've also got this compliance information should you ever need it. So that's all of the settings you need to know about in the receiver. Let's take a look next at the transmitters. So this is the internal microphone built into the transmitter and this port you can attach an external microphone or a lav mic. The status indicator on this corner tells you whether or not you're connected to a receiver. It's currently solid green, that means we're connected. But if this is blinking slowly green, that means you're disconnected from the receiver. You'll actually notice that on the receiver display anyway. On this side, you've got a USB-C port. You can use this to transfer the internal internally recorded audio files from the transmitter to your computer and you can also use this to charge this independently of the case. If you hold down this power button it's going to turn off this transmitter. You can see now the display has changed here telling us we've only got the other transmitter transmitting and hold it down again to turn it back on. If you want to mute this transmitter just press this power button twice. You can see now the status indicator here is telling us that this transmitter is muted. And to unmute, double tap the power button again. The transmitters come with a magnet, which you can use to attach to clothing. And they also have this crocodile clip. This is the linking button, which allows you to manually link this transmitter to a receiver. And you also have this record button to start or stop internal recording. If I press this button, Notice that nothing's actually happening in the receiver display. That's because we've got that record stop lock feature enabled. So I can't accidentally stop internal recording by pressing this button. This is the recording status LED. It's currently red. That means we're recording internal audio. But if I just double tap the power button again, notice that this is now pulsing on and off red. That means we're muted. And you can see once again in the receiver that we're not receiving any signal. You can either double tap the power button to unmute or swipe up from the bottom right and tap in the middle here to unmute. Now the LED goes back to solid red. Let's see next how to actually set this system up with a camera. The first thing you're going to want to do is have a look in this case and it comes with this little cold shoe mount. What you want to do is take the receiver and then you take this little clip fold this section out and then you slot it into this hole here. It can be a bit fiddly, so just be gentle and take your time. And now this is a cold shoe mount, which we can fit to a camera. So I'm just using this as a, a model camera. I'm gonna fold out this cold shoe mount and then just gently slot it into the cold shoe. So if you have it this way around, it means if you're filming yourself, you can see the screen, but if you're filming other people and you wanna be able to see the display, you simply just rotate it around 
and then fit it in backwards. Just change it back to the front. Once you've got the receiver attached to the camera, you can then use the supplied audio cable that comes with it. What you want to do is take one end of this cable and attach it to the out port on the receiver. Don't accidentally attach this to the headphone port. So we'll go ahead and plug this in to the out port and then take the other end of this cable and plug it in to the microphone input on your camera. This audio cable is going to send the audio signal that's received from the transmitter down and into the camera. So the receiver itself doesn't record any internal audio. The only audio that the DJI mic system actually records itself are the audio files in each of the transmitter if you've turned on internal recording. You can now go and attach one of the transmitters to a person for example. So you've got this magnet to use this. You can basically, looks slightly dodgy, put the microphone up inside your t-shirt and then clip the transmitter on like that. You can also do it the opposite way around, so you've got the transmitter hidden underneath your shirt. You can experiment with these different ways just to find what feels most comfortable or what produces the best sound quality for you. If you've got a shirt or something like that, you could also use the crocodile clips rather than the magnets. So once you've set up the receiver as you want it, you've attached the audio cable and you've got the transmitters attached to the people that you're recording, you can go and set the audio levels. The first step is to change the transmitter gain for each of the people that you're working with. So what I'm gonna do just to simplify things, I'm just gonna turn off this other transmitter. So as I'm talking now, you can see this volume bar going up and down. This is the audio level that the receiver is receiving from this transmitter. You can see we're currently set to plus 12 transmitter gain. If I just speak into this, notice that it's going really red. So I'm just simulating what would happen here if you're recording a person that has a really loud pronounced voice. In this case you can see if we get into the red it's going to sound terrible. So in that case we're going to need to reduce transmitter gain. Swipe down from the top, go across to transmitter settings, go into transmitter gain. We're currently using transmitter 2 so I'm going to tap that. Now I'm going to reduce that from plus 12. Let's try negative 1. Swipe up and I'll do the same test again. I'll get really close. Notice now that we're not actually getting into the red, we're just getting into that yellow occasionally. So that's a much better level for that kind of loud voice. Let me try and talk really quietly. So you probably can't even hear that. I was just really going low. See how we were really low down on that volume meter then for a quietly spoken person. In that case, you'd want to increase that transmitter gain. So you're getting most of the way up in the green here occasionally in the yellow. The next thing you're going to want to do is go into your camera audio recording settings. First of all, you're going to want to disable any automatic volume correction, any automatic wind noise reduction, and essentially you want to go into whichever option allows you to set the recording volume manually. Start off by reducing the camera's recording volume to almost as low as it will go, and then in the receiver settings here, come into receive again and start to increase this. I suggest starting with something low so you don't overload your camera, and then just gradually increase that until you start to see a good signal in your camera's volume meter. Every camera's got a slightly different looking volume meter but you want to be hitting mostly in the green, very occasionally in the yellow, or depending what's marked on your camera's volume meter, aim for about the negative 12 dB mark as an average. You don't want to really ever see red in your camera's volume meter. If you follow this process you should get the best possible signal quality with the lowest amount of possible noise. The final thing we're going to look at are these funny looking things here. These are the windshields that fit on to the transmitters. And all you do is you find the little circle inside here, slot it over the internal microphone, and then gently twist and you'll hear a gentle click. You want to use these anytime you're filming outside and there's any wind. It'll just help cut down some of that wind noise. Where and how you put up your camera while filming can have a massive difference on how you look and how your overall video feels. Let's look next at camera angles and tripods. The camera angle or camera height that you choose has a surprising effect on how the viewer will feel and perceive the video you're making. There's a few different camera angles to choose from, let's look at some of the more common ones. At the minute I'm looking straight down the lens at you with the camera position and eye level height. This is an eye level or neutral angle shot. If I look over at the camera screen, the centre guide line that I've turned on is running straight across my eye line here. This angle feels very natural and it's like we're connecting in real life. It feels more intimate somehow and less like you're watching me and more like we're having a conversation together. We could go and zoom in the lens, currently at 24, let's go all the way up to 50 and this still feels pretty natural. So this eye level shot is a great choice for YouTube videos for example because it's a more personal interaction with the YouTube audience. Just as a quick tip remember to line up the eye level with the center of the lens and not the bottom or the top or the center of the camera body. Another quick tip is if you're filming yourself on your own to save yourself having to go backwards and forwards to the camera just to move the camera up and down instead you can grab a stand and maybe put a crossbar across and then just put it across here 
it at eye level, leave the stand in the frame and then go behind the camera and then move the camera up or down until the center guideline matches up with that crossbar. All right, let's take a look at the next shot. I'm gonna use that technique using this C-stand arm here. So that's about shoulder level height. I can just leave that in the frame now and come back to the camera on the stand here and then just drop this down until that center grid line is running across that C-stand arm. So that should give us a shoulder level shot. So this is an example of a shoulder level shot. I haven't tilted the camera up at all yet. It's still vertically and horizontally level. If I were to zoom in and change the focal length, Let's go to 50 millimeters and I'm gonna stand in the same spot. You can see my head's a bit out of frame now. So depending on the focal length you're using, you might have to tilt the camera up a bit. Let's see how that looks now. I'll just stand on the same spot. And by using a shoulder level shot, you can kind of minimize the amount of head space above a person's head here. So the shoulder level shot is an example of a very slight low angle shot. And it can feel a little bit more movie-like or a little bit more cinematic than a straight flat eyeline level shot. If we move the camera down a bit closer to the floor and then tilt it up, we get this low angle shot. This is a more pronounced below eye level shot. A low angle shot makes the person look bigger, stronger, more important or more authoritative. As long as you don't overdo it, this kind of low angle shot can be a good choice for educational style content as it can make you appear a bit more knowledgeable and feel like an authority on the subject. The closer the camera gets to the floor and the more you tilt it up, the more pronounced this effect will look. Let's take a look next at the high angle shot. But first, if this is the first time we're meeting, welcome, I'm Jason Roberts. This channel is all about making better looking, better sounding and better edited video. If that's something that would be useful to you, please subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. Raising your camera up and tilting it down like this creates a high angle shot or above eye level shot. High angle shots can make the person feel less powerful, smaller or weaker. The higher you go with the camera and the more you tilt it down, the more you'll notice this effect. Notice how you feeling about me subconsciously now, you're probably feeling like I seem a bit weaker and less like I know what I'm talking about. That's the effect this high angle can give you. When you're getting set up to film yourself, there's a few different ways that you can position the camera so you can actually see yourself and get on with the video. If you don't have any of the other things I'm gonna be talking about later in this video, the easiest way is to just use a book or a cushion or something to prop up your camera or phone so you can actually see yourself. You might have to put your camera a bit further away on a table or a chair just so you can get enough of yourself in the picture. If you're using a phone to film yourself you can get a tripod that has a phone adapter so you can just clip the phone to the tripod if you don't want to get a big tripod you can use this alternative from peak design basically it's a case that fits around your phone so it provides some protection for your phone for a start, but it's also got this magnetic attachment and I'll show you how that works. The great thing about this system is that there's loads of different attachments you get. There's this little tripod and all you do is you extend out the legs and then it just magnetically attaches to the phone then you can film either vertically like this or film normal widescreen videos. There's also other attachments that will clip to the case like this mount here, just show you how that works. Don't have to change the case, you just snap this on. And at the bottom here is a quick release plate. So you can attach that to a tripod if you've got a tripod that has a quick release plate. Or you can use other adapters to attach this to bikes and even just loosen this off. Just rotate this around. And you could even use it in combination with some of the other stuff from Peak Design to clip it onto your body or your bag and create that kind of point of view look. This little tripod's also great if you have like a script or something that you want to put on your phone when you're making your videos. By the way, I'll put links to everything I'm talking about in the description for this video. What about if you're not using a phone, you're using a camera? There's a few different options. If you just want something small and fairly flexible, literally flexible because you can bend the legs, you can get something like this Gorilla Pod. There's a few different sizes for this Gorilla Pod and it will depend on how heavy your camera is or how big your camera is as to which version you want. It comes with this ball head and you can kind of do some interesting things with these legs because you can really bend them around and wrap them around kind of strange looking things. A word of warning though, when you're using a Gorilla Pod, if you're using it like this, make sure it's not gonna fall off. And even if you're using it as a standard tripod, just make sure that the legs are actually gonna be super stable and it's not accidentally gonna fall over. I've had that happen a couple of times. If you want a tripod that's going to go a bit higher than this thing, so you can put the camera at eye level, like I've got it here, you're gonna to want to go for a more traditional tripod. I've had this piece design tripod for years now and I absolutely love it. This particular one that I've got is a carbon fiber one so it's even lighter than the other version and I really love the kind of ball head that they've got on this thing. It's really easy to turn and position the camera to get the exact angle that you want. It also folds up really nice and compact for travel. You could of course go for an even more traditional kind of tripod like this Winston 2.0 from Three Legged Thing. The benefit of this tripod over the Peak Design one is that it actually goes a bit higher and if you extend the center column even higher you've just 
just got to be careful when you're extending the center column of tripods because they can get a bit more unstable and if you're filming outside with a lot of wind you're going to get a lot of wobble what i would say is whichever tripod you decide to go with make sure it's got a quick release system so you can fit a plate to the bottom of the camera and then quickly slot it in and out of the tripod head without having to screw things together or fiddle about with stuff it's just going to make filming videos a lot quicker and a lot more easy whether you're filming yourself with a camera or a smartphone the choice of lens and also one other important setting will have a big effect on how your video will look there's two main things that will affect how you look on camera the first is the focal length or how zoomed in you are and the second is the aperture if you're filming on a smartphone that has multiple lenses or cameras on the back you can switch between them to get different focal lengths or if your phone only has one lens and one camera you can use a digital zoom to zoom in just be aware that if you zoom in too much you're going to lose resolution and the video quality will start to look worse on a camera with a fixed built-in lens you can use the zoom to change the focal length and on an interchangeable lens camera you can either swap out the lens or fit a zoom lens that allows you to zoom in and out and change the focal length this shot you're looking at now is being filmed on a 24 millimeter focal length and that's towards the wider end of what you're probably going to want to use most of the time if you're vlogging and holding the camera out here you might want to go a bit wider something like a 16 millimeter or 20 millimeter focal length that's going to mean that your face is not going to appear really big in the frame and you're also going to be able to get a bit of the background in to give a bit of context on where you're actually vlogging when you use a shorter focal length like this 24 millimeter you get to see a lot more of the space that you're filming in if the only lens you have is a wide angle lens and you don't want to see as much of the background and you want to seem a bit bigger in the frame you can move the camera closer to you just be aware that wide angle lenses close up can make your face look a bit weird next up we've got this 35 millimeter focal length this focal length is great if you want to see a bit less of the background and it also won't make your face look quite as weird if you move the camera closer to you so this is what it looks like with a 50 millimeter focal length we've still got the camera in the same position there and 50 millimeters gives you a nice natural look on the face without it looking weird and warpy we can see a lot less of the background now than at 35 millimeters but if you did want to see more of the background then you'll have to move the camera further away which you might not have space to do all right let's crank it up to 70 so this is what it looks like with a 70 millimeter focal length we're seeing a lot less of the background now and if you want to get more of it in you'll have to move the camera even further away if you get yourself a 24 to 70 millimeter zoom lens like the one i'm filming on right now it'll give you a lot of flexibility when you're filming yourself i'll put a link in the description to the exact lens i'm filming on here the second most important thing about choosing a lens is finding out what apertures the lens allows you to set lenses that have wider apertures allow you to let more light into the sensor which means they're better for darker situations also wider aperture lenses can allow you to blur the background more at the moment this shot is using an aperture of f 3.5 and in the background there you should see it looks a bit blurry and this is what the shot looks like with a smaller aperture f8 you should be able to see in the background that the background is a bit less blurred now because i've made the aperture smaller less light is getting into the camera so i've had to increase the iso which might mean that you see a bit more noise in this image and this is what it looks like with an even smaller aperture of f16 i've had to increase the iso even more now but you should be able to notice in the background things are even less blurry let's just switch back to f3.5 the smaller the f number the wider the aperture the more light gets in and the blurry at the background becomes lenses that allow you to set a smaller f number usually cost more but if you can afford it i'd recommend trying to get at least an f 2.8 lens it's not that you can't get great looking shots with an f4 lens but f 2.8 gives you more creative flexibility and allows you to film in slightly darker conditions this 24 to 70 millimeter zoom lens i'm filming on at the minute has a minimum aperture of f 2.8 when you're shopping for a lens usually the advertised aperture is going to be the minimum that the lens supports the wider the aperture or the lower the f number the lens supports the less light you're going to need so if you're just using window light for example to film yourself that's another good reason to try and get at least an f 2.8 lens a 2.8 aperture lens also means that if you're using lights those lights don't have to be quite as powerful one of the scariest things about making youtube videos sometimes is actually just being on camera if you feel anxious or uncomfortable while filming yourself you're not alone 
all own. But don't worry, I've got 13 tips for you next to look and feel better on camera. When I first started recording myself, I was so stiff and robotic. Hi, in this video, I wanted to talk about how you start a YouTube channel or in fact start anything else. And I wish I'd had this video that I'm making right now so I could send it back in time to my past self to kind of get a quick start about how to get better at talking to camera. By the end of this video, you're going to be in love with your lens or at least not be terrified of it. Let's talk sausages. The first tip I've got for you is no one's going to know how the sausage was made. What I mean by that is that you can make as many mistakes as you like on camera, start and stop recording, format the memory card and just give up and then start all over again. All anybody's ever going to see is the final version that you upload to YouTube. So don't be afraid of making mistakes and don't get all flustered and down in the dumps. Everyone makes mistakes while talking to the camera. You've just got to keep trying and just remember you're in control of the sausage. The second tip I've got for you is how to prepare to actually press record and be on camera. If you're feeling a bit tense and a bit kind of wound up, one thing you can do, and it's going to seem a little bit crazy, but just bear with me, is you can just kind of shake your body out. This is going to seem a bit weird. You just kind of shake things out and just kind of get loosened up. And I know that seems a bit strange, but it's just a way of almost getting out of your own head a little bit and just kind of getting in touch with your body so you're not overthinking when you're about to press record. The next tip I've got for you is also going to help you prepare to press record and be more comfortable on camera, and that's to use what are called power poses. So I watched this really interesting TED talk ages ago, and the presenter was saying how adopting certain postures can actually change your physical hormone levels and basically give you more confidence. If you're getting ready to film your video and you're kind of slumped over like this, or you've got your arms folded, they're not power poses and they're gonna kind of sap your physical energy in your body. Instead, you can adopt a power pose. So open up your chest and your arms and just stand like this, almost like a superhero. Or you can put your arms on your hips here and just imagine yourself in a superhero cape. I know it sounds a bit weird, but it actually does help. The next tip to get more comfortable on camera before you hit record, just go and listen to some songs that really pump you up and get you energized and motivated and feeling in a really good mood. So these could be energizing tracks that really get you going, or if you're feeling a little bit too over caffeinated, maybe in a bit too high energy already, maybe you could listen to some calming or soothing music, whatever works for you. The next tip is something I like to call the 5,000 year rule. Now, this is not meant to sound demotivating, but what I want you to do is imagine that this video that you're making right now is never gonna be around in 5,000 years. That's not to get you down in the dumps or to think what's the point in filming it then. It's more just to give yourself a bit of perspective about a lot of things that people are doing nowadays won't even be remembered in 1,000 years, let alone 5,000 years. So just give yourself permission to relax a little bit and have fun while trying to make your video. Doing some kind of breath work before you hit record can really help to centre yourself and if you're feeling a bit nervous and anxious it can help with that too. So there's loads of different types of breathing patterns or breath work. One that I like to do is called box breathing. You breathe in for four seconds, hold for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds and then hold for four seconds. And you just repeat that cycle a few different times. Obviously, if you've got any health issues or you get dizzy, you better stop it or check with your doctor first, of course. Another strange thing I saw on a TED talk once to prepare to give speeches or even talk on camera is the practice of making a kind of a siren noise. And it kind of just gets your face and your lips and your mouth warmed up a bit. And it also sounds a bit funny, so it can make you laugh and release a bit of tension. All you do is you do this. Wee, wah, wee. You are. <laughs> it feels very, very strange doing that on camera, knowing everyone's going to see that. But obviously when you do it, no one's going to see it. The next tip I've got for you is to make friends with the lens or the camera that you're filming on. And all I mean by this is it's kind of a cliche thing that everyone talks about, but it's either imagining that the lens is a person or imagining that the lens is a specific person, perhaps a friend. And that just helps you feel a bit more comfortable with talking to that little black hole in the center of the lens. When you're trying to get stronger or build muscle at the gym, it's all about reps, reps, reps. And what I mean by that is you just don't go in one day, lift a dumbbell once, put it down, and then you're strong. You do several sets and several reps over weeks, months, and years, and eventually you get stronger and better at doing the exercises. Talking to camera is a lot like that. The more you do it, the more you practice, you're gonna get better over time and gradually feel more comfortable and more at home talking to the lens. 
The next tip I've got for you is to give yourself a hand. And what I mean by that is I'm just going to change the way I'm talking to you right now. While I'm still talking to you, I'm not really moving my body and I've got my hands across my body here. And it's kind of quite a defensive and not a very open posture to adopt when talking to the lens. If I just move my arms down here and just kind of put them in front of me, that also doesn't feel very inviting for you watching right now. But if I start to use my hands and talk with my hands, it feels a bit more natural and a bit more open and just feels a bit Bit more friendly really. This doesn't come naturally to a lot of people and when I first started making videos I was very robotic just talking like this. Now I try and explain things by using my hands and I try not to just do jazz hands all the time just for no reason but as I'm talking I'm thinking I'm using my hands to also think and talk. The next tip I've got for you to feel more comfortable on camera, and if you feel more comfortable, you're gonna basically make better videos, is to dress in a way that's comfortable for you and that gives you confidence. This will also depend on the niche or the kind of channel you've got. For example, if you're creating a lawyer channel or perhaps a personal finance channel, you're possibly not gonna sit there in board shorts and a ripped singlet. Suppose you could do though, you'll definitely stand out. And you can do some simple things like just making sure that your t-shirt is ironed, not that I'm particularly good at ironing, just little things like that to give you a bit more confidence and basically one less thing to worry about when you're talking to the camera. Remembering to give a bit of a smile on camera is not only a great way to create more engaging, friendly videos, but it also kind of psychologically makes you feel a bit more comfortable as well. And it's something I always forget to do. I'm not perfect by any means, but just trying to start a sentence by, even if it seems a bit artificial and a bit weird, just force a bit of a smile and then keep talking. The next tip is this 10% rule idea and basically what this is is knowing that the camera is going to kind of almost automatically portray you as being a bit lower energy, maybe a bit quieter. So what you can do is just be yourself but just add a 10% more energy on top of what you think you need and that will come across on camera. Let me show you what I mean. So if I just talk kind of like I would to camera like this, it's very low energy and it might be sounding or seeming a bit normal to me, but if I just add that 10% extra energy, you don't have to go overboard with it. You really wanna be authentic and be authentic to yourself and to your viewers, but just try to nudge things up about 10%. But don't go crazy flamboyant and be someone you're not and move all this around like this, mate. Be authentic to who you are. Now you know how to set up your camera on a tripod and also how to feel less uncomfortable while talking to the camera. You can make sure you've got your memory card and it's got space on it. Make sure your battery's fully charged either use manual focus to check that where you're going to be standing is in focus or better still use autofocus and then hit record. When you've finished recording your video you're going to want to edit it so it can be the best it can be before you go and upload it to YouTube. There's loads of different video editing apps you can choose from. Some you have to pay for, some are subscription based and some are completely free like the one I'm going to show you next. Whether you're coming from Premiere Pro or Final Cut or this is your first time editing and you've decided to use DaVinci Resolve, your first few videos editing in DaVinci Resolve are going to seem a bit tricky and maybe a bit hard to understand what's going on. Don't worry I'm going to cover everything you need to know right from creating a project all the way through to actually exporting or rendering your final video. We're going to learn about project creation, timeline creation, how to move around the timeline, how to zoom in and out and some tips for editing more quickly. First thing we need to do is go and create a project. So let's go and open up DaVinci Resolve and when it opens it's going to take us to this screen. To create a project come down to the bottom right here and click the new project button and then give this project a name. We'll call this Learn Resolve and click Create. And now our project will open up in DaVinci Resolve. One thing to be aware of is when you create a project in DaVinci Resolve, you're not actually going to create a project file anywhere on your disk. This might be a bit strange if you're coming from something like Premiere Pro, where when you create a project, you specify a location on disk for that project file. In Resolve, all projects are stored inside the DaVinci Resolve project database. You can actually export projects from the DaVinci Resolve database as separate files on your file system, but you don't really have to worry about that for the minute. Just understand that when you create a project, it's going to be held inside the DaVinci Resolve database, and you don't really have to worry too much about it, unless of course your computer crashes and you lose that database. So now we've created this project, you can come up to the file menu, come down to project settings and now you can see all of the settings for this project. If you want to you can change the default settings for the timelines in this project. For example we can change the timeline resolution, we could change this to 4k UHD and you can also choose your default timeline frame rate here. For example you could choose 25, 30, let's leave this at 23.976 
Once you've set up these settings, if you want to use them for all new future projects you create, come up to these three dots, left click and choose set current settings as default preset. If you do that, you're going to get this prompt telling you whether you want to update the default presets. And if we click update, anytime we create a new project, it's going to be set to 4K UHD 23.976 and with all these other settings. So let's just click save for now. And now we've got this project set up, we can go and import music and video and other files into it. Let's see how to do that next. There's a few different ways to import media into DaVinci Resolve. We're currently in the cut workspace here, but the best place to do this really is the media workspace. So click on media at the bottom left here. This will open up the media workspace. At the top here, we've got storage locations that we can get our media from, such as videos and audio. If you don't see this, just click this little button here to open it up. At the bottom here, we've got the media pool. Anything in the media pool is available to us when we're editing inside this project. We need to add media files into this media pool. When we do that, the media files exist in one or more bins. We get this master bin by default, but we can create other bins ourselves. For example, to create a camera bin, right click on master, come down and choose new bin. We get this bin here, we can give it a name. We'll just call it camera. Bins inside DaVinci Resolve are logical places where you can organize your footage in different assets. They don't actually get created on your physical hard disk on your computer. They're just part of the database for this project. Now we've got this camera bin, we can open it by double clicking on the folder or just clicking on it in the bin tree here. And one way to import media into your project is to simply drag and drop it from your computer. So for example, let's come into this folder, into this footage folder and into this camera folder. And here we've got a file from a Sony a7S III. To import this, we can simply drag it from the folder here and drag it on top of a bin. You might get this warning to change the project frame rate. Don't worry about this for now, just click don't change. Now if we come back to DaVinci Resolve, we've got that clip imported. If you move your mouse left and right on this clip, you can get a preview of it. And if you single click on it, it gets opened up in the preview window here, where you can scrub through it or play it back. Another way you can import footage is by using the media sources here. To add a new media location here, right click in an empty space and choose add new location and then navigate to it on your local machine. For example, we could just add the entire D drive here by clicking select folder. And because it already exists, we're getting this warning. I've already added the D drive here. And if I expand this down, you can see all of the folders inside that D drive. Clicking on the parent shows you all of the folders here. What we're going to do is expand this down, come into the footage folder, and we're going to import this stock footage folder into the project. What I'm going to do is make sure we've got the master bin selected because we want to add it under that. And I'm going to right click on this stock footage folder and I'm going to choose this option, add folder and subfolders into media pool, create bins. When we do that, we get a new bin created that matches the name of the physical folder on the disk, stock footage. And inside that, we get all of the media that was inside that physical folder on the hard disk. Let's go and do the same for this music folder. Make sure you're on master right click on music and choose add folder and subfolders into media pool creating bins. Now under our master bin, we've got this camera bin, this music bin and this stock footage bin. If you're wondering where I get my music from, for over four years now I've been using Epidemic Sound. They have loads of music and also sound effects. If you want to get a free month of Epidemic Sound to use in your own videos, check out the link in the description. So we've got all of these files now inside these bins. One really important thing to remember is that when you add folders or files into your project here, they're not actually getting copied from wherever they were on hard disk into the DaVinci Resolve database. It's just really pointing to those files on disk. That means that if you go and delete any of those media files on disk, they'll no longer be available to this project and you won't be able to use them to edit with. So now we've got these media files in this project, let's go and create a timeline to actually edit them inside of. The timeline is basically a place where you can put all of your assets together and when you're happy with the edit, export that timeline to a final rendered file. There's a few different ways you can create timelines in DaVinci Resolve. If you have a few clips that you know you're going to want to use in that timeline, select them all, right click on one of them and come up to create new timeline using selected clips. If you click that, we can now choose a name for the timeline. We'll just call it demo. You can select how many starting video and audio tracks you want. You can actually change this later. So don't worry too much about this for now. By default, it's going to use whatever you set up in the project, but if you want to choose different settings, untick this tick box. And now you can change things such as the resolution and frame rate. We'll just leave it as use project settings and then hit create. You can see now down here, we've got the timeline created. You'll probably want to move it to a timelines folder or up to the master level here. You can do that by dragging and dropping. Now we've got our timeline in the master bin. 
just going to delete this by clicking on it and pressing backspace on the keyboard and then clicking delete. If you just want to create an empty timeline with no starting clips, come over to the edit page or the cut page and make sure you've got this media pool opened up. Right click in an empty space, come to timelines and choose create new timeline. And once again, give it a name and click create. Alternatively, you can come up to the file menu and choose new timeline. Once you've created a timeline, if you want to check what its settings are, right click on it in the media pool, come to the timelines menu and choose timeline settings. You can now check what these settings are or untick this and then make some changes to them. I'll just hit cancel for now. So now we've got our media imported into the project and the timeline created, we can actually start to go and create our edit. There's a few different ways you can add clips to a timeline in DaVinci Resolve. We're currently in the edit workspace here, come up and make sure the media pool is open and then navigate to the place that has the footage that you want to add to the timeline. We'll just come into this camera bin. If you don't see the thumbnail here, you can change the views with these buttons and you can move your mouse left and right to get a preview or double click to open up the clip in the source viewer here. This gives you a bigger preview that you can scrub through or play back. The first way to add clips to the timeline is to simply drag them from the media pool down into the timeline window here. The blue bit at the top is the video information and the green bit at the bottom is the audio information. Above this center line here, we've got video tracks and below this center line here, we've got audio tracks. Just going to remove this by clicking on it and hit backspace. In addition to dragging and dropping, you can use the keyboard shortcuts. Position the playhead where you want to insert this clip, select the clip and then simply hit F9 on the keyboard and that will insert the clip at that point in the timeline. There's lots of other ways to add clips to the timeline, but we'll keep it simple for now. Often, however, you don't want to add the entire clip to the timeline, you might just want a small portion of it. Let's see how to do that next. To add just part of a clip to a timeline in DaVinci Resolve, the first thing you're going to want to do is open up the source clip. Just going to double click that to open it in the source viewer. Now you can use the playhead here, choose where you want to start the clip when you add it to the timeline. So let's select about here. Hit I on the keyboard to add what's called an in point. This is where we want the footage to start when we drag it to the timeline. If you wanted all of this footage from this point till the end, you could just leave it as it is. But if you just wanted a portion of it, let's say about there, hit O on the keyboard and you can see this section here. This is telling us that when we add this to the timeline, it's just going to add this portion and not anything before or after it. You can also see these two lines up here telling us where the in and out point is. Now, if I drag this into the timeline, it's only dragged in that point between the in and the out points. But what do you do if you only want perhaps just the video portion of a clip or just the audio portion of a clip? Let's check that out next. To add just the video part of a clip and not the audio part in DaVinci Resolve, first of all, open the clip in the timeline viewer by double clicking it in the media pool. If you don't see the media pool, just click this button, double click on the clip. And if I just drag this down, by default, we get both the video and the audio here. Let's delete that. But if you don't want the audio, you just want the video, hover over this section here and then drag this little icon here down onto the timeline. And now you can see we've just got the video portion and not the audio for that clip. If you want to do the opposite and just get the audio, hover over this section here and this time drag this little wave icon down into the timeline. Now you can see that we've just got the audio and not the video for that clip. So now we know how to add clips to the timeline. Let's learn next how we can navigate and move around that timeline so we know where we are. To zoom in and out of a timeline in DaVinci Resolve, there's a number of different ways. The first way is to hold down shift and hit Z on the keyboard. This is going to zoom in and fill the timeline with all of the clips. If you want to go back to the previous zoom level, just hit shift Z again. There's a number of buttons that you can choose here. The first is this full extent zoom. If you click this, it's going to fill up the entire timeline. The next button is detailed zoom. If you click on that, this is going to zoom in to give you more detail. And the next button is custom zoom. If you click on that, you can then use this slider by clicking the plus and negative buttons or just using this slider here to zoom in and out. Alternatively, you can hold down control on your keyboard and use the plus and minus keys to zoom out and to zoom in, use control plus. You can also hold down alt and use the scroll wheel on your mouse to either zoom out or zoom in. There's also a number of different ways to move around the timeline. You can use the up arrow on the keyboard to move to a previous edit point or the down arrow on the keyboard to move to a following edit point. You can also use this scroll bar at the top to scroll around the timeline or hold down control on the keyboard and use the mouse scroll wheel to scroll the timeline left and right. So now we know how to navigate around the timeline, let's go and start cutting clips together to create our edit. There's a few different ways to cut clips up and make them shorter or longer in DaVinci Resolve. We've got three clips on the timeline here. 
The first way you can make cuts is to use the blade tool. We're currently in selection mode here with this red arrow selected. To switch to blade edit mode, click on this razor blade here, or alternatively hit B on the keyboard. If we move over this now, you can see we've got this razor blade icon. I'll just zoom in a bit. Now all you need to do is move this razor blade where you want to create a cut. So let's say somewhere in the middle of this clip and then left click. And now we get an edit point. We've effectively cut that clip in half. What we can do now is switch back to edit mode by clicking the arrow here or hitting A on the keyboard, selecting the second half of that clip and then hitting backspace on the keyboard to remove it. We've effectively cut out that second half of the clip now. If we don't want to cut out a middle portion and we just want to make the start or the end shorter or longer, we don't have to use the blade tool for that. We can stay in the selection mode tool here and then come over and hover over the left hand side of the clip till you get this icon and then move the mouse to the right to make it shorter or left to make it longer. You can do the same at the end, make the clip shorter by moving the mouse to the left or make it longer by moving the mouse to the right. Let's go and make this first clip shorter and then we'll just left click on this and drag it to move it up and then left click and drag this. Now we've got a simple edit of three clips that are a bit shorter. There's a feature in DaVinci Resolve called ripple editing and basically what this is is it's a way of making it a lot quicker to edit because Resolve will automatically close up gaps when you make clips shorter or longer and you can also use it to delete gaps in your timeline really quickly. Let's take a look at that next. There's a few different ways to use ripple editing in DaVinci Resolve to make editing quicker. For example, we've got this empty space in the timeline. We could go and select all of the other clips after it and then move them all up. But if you've got a complicated timeline with loads of clips, that's a bit time consuming. Instead, just left click on this empty area and then hit backspace on the keyboard. This will remove the space and notice how it shifted these other two clips over to the left to fill up the gap. Suppose we wanted to make this clip shorter, we could click on it and then make it shorter and then click on this empty space and hit backspace. But there's a much quicker way and that's to use the trim edit tool. You can change to trim edit mode by clicking this button here or hitting T on the keyboard. Now watch what happens if we try and make this clip shorter. If I drag to the left, notice it's making this middle clip shorter but it's also automatically closing up the gap. It's moving the right hand clip over so we don't end up with a wasted space. And if we move this to the right, the clip gets longer and notice this clip has automatically moved with it. We can do this at the start of the clip as well. Let's go back to this middle clip and we'll make it shorter. Now we're going to start the clip at a different position and also make the middle clip shorter. Even if you're not in trim edit mode, let's switch back to selection mode here. You can use the ripple trim keyboard shortcuts. So for example, say we wanted to trim off this trailing section of this middle clip. Make sure either nothing is selected or the clip you want to trim is selected. Hold down control and shift and then hit the right square bracket on the keyboard. Watch what happens. It trims the end and automatically moves this clip up. Let's say we only wanted a little bit of this clip towards the end. Once again, make sure nothing is selected or the clip is selected. This time hold down control shift and use the left square bracket. This trims out everything before the playhead and then moves these two clips along. Sometimes you might import a clip into the timeline and you want to make it just a bit more zoomed in and perhaps just adjust the position a little bit. Let's see how to do that. If you want to zoom in a bit on a clip in DaVinci Resolve, select the clip that you want to zoom in on. And then if it's not already open, click on this inspector button to open up the inspector. In the video tab here under this transform section, we can zoom in on the image by either typing a value into either the zoom X or zoom Y position. Let's do 1.5. Or you can hold down your left mouse button over the zoom X or zoom Y positions and then move it left or right to zoom it either in or out. Sometimes when you zoom in, you might want to change the position. You can do this by either left clicking and dragging on the X position to move it left and right, or left clicking and dragging on the position Y to move it up and down. Just going to reset all of these transform properties by clicking this button here to go back to the starting settings. So while you can use these starting settings, there's an easier and more visual way to do that. What you want to do is come down to the bottom left of the viewer here, click this little drop down icon and make sure transform is selected. If you click on it, this transform square box goes white and now we've got these lines around the viewer. You can use the scroll wheel to zoom out a bit. And now to zoom in, select one of these handles and to zoom in, drag it outwards and to zoom out, drag it inwards. If you want to reposition this, just left click anywhere inside this box and then move it around with your mouse. Once you've finished, you can click here to toggle off the transform overlay. Let's see next how we can alter the volume levels of either video files or music. 
There's a few different ways you can change the volume levels of clips or music in DaVinci Resolve. The first way is to change it at the individual clip level. So I've got this clip in the timeline and I'm just going to hold down shift and use the scroll wheel to expand the size of the audio track just so we can see what's going on. If you want to change the volume level of an individual clip, make sure it's selected. And then if you hover over this green area, eventually you'll find this very faint line with this up and down arrow. This is the volume level for the clip. If you want to make it louder, move this arrow up by holding down the left mouse button. And you can see now the total volume for this clip is 11.84. And if the clip is too loud while it's playing back, you can actually drag this line down and make the clip quieter. Now we're at negative 14.35 decibels. If you let go of the mouse button, this clip will be set to a lower volume now. You can also see this volume setting by opening up the inspector making sure the clip is selected and coming over to the audio tab. And we can see the volume here has been set negative 14.35. If we move this up and down, watch what's happening in the clip. It's doing exactly the same thing, just using this slider instead. Just gonna close the inspector for a minute. And what happens if you've got multiple clips? So we'll just go and create some edit points there. If you wanted to adjust the volume of all of these clips the same, it's gonna be pretty tedious going and finding these and dragging them up and down, just undo those. You can instead change the volume for an entire audio track. Currently, all of these are on this audio one audio track. To change the volume for an entire track, open up the mixer here by clicking on it. And if you can't see all of the tracks, you can drag it across. We want to work with this audio one track. And now we can just lower the volume if all of the clips are too loud or increase the volume if all of the clips are too quiet. And when you're done with this mixer, click up here to close it. Just gonna zoom in on this clip here. Sometimes you might find that there's just a little portion of a clip that's just too loud. For example, putting a glass down on a table or something banging. In that case, you can zoom in. I'm just gonna use Control Plus here to really zoom in on this audio portion. And let's say this section here, we wanted to make quieter. What you need to do is find that same line again with the up and down arrow hold down Alt on your keyboard and then left click. You can see we get this red dot. This is adding an audio keyframe. Add another red dot right next to it. And then on the other side, add two more red dots. Now in the middle here, you can just drag this line down and this will lower the volume of this clip just in this specific location. You can make your edits look even better with some very simple basic knowledge of color grading. Let's do that next. To get started color grading in DaVinci Resolve, open up your timeline and then come down and choose the color workspace by clicking the color button here. If you've got the gallery or LUTs or media pool open, just close them all down until you've got the main view and this side on the right here is where we can see the color grading nodes. When you first open up the color page in DaVinci Resolve, it can be a bit overwhelming. Don't worry, we're just gonna concentrate on the basics here so you can get started with the common things that you need to do when you're color grading or trying to make a clip look a bit better. The first thing to be aware of is that DaVinci Resolve uses a nodes-based approach. Here's our first default node here. And basically a node is a place where you can perform some operation on the color, whether that's making it darker or brighter, making it more blue or more orange, whatever it might be. You can do everything in one single node if you want to, but usually it's better to use multiple nodes and each node can kind of represent a thing that you're trying to achieve. By doing this, it's also easier to undo mistakes if you make them because you're only making a mistake in one node doing one single thing. What I'm gonna do is just drag this over to make a little bit more space in the nodes section here. And what we're going to do is add a new node. There's lots of ways to do this. The easiest way is to either right click, come down to the add node menu and choose add serial node. Another way to do it is to use Alt S on the keyboard to add a new node. You can actually accomplish quite a lot with just three nodes in DaVinci Resolve and using some of the most basic essential tools. So don't get overwhelmed at this point. What we're going to do is use this first node to change the brightness of the image. To keep track of what you're doing, you can right click on a node and click on node label and then give this node a name. We'll call this first node brightness. The second node we're going to use to add or remove contrast. Let's right click, choose node label and give this a name of contrast. And this third node we're going to use to modify the colors. Make sure you've got this first brightness node selected by clicking on it. And we're going to use these color wheels. Make sure you're not in this HDR grade or any of these other things. You wanna be in this color wheels. These are called the primary color wheels or just the primaries for short. With these four wheels, you can really control the brightness of the image. On the left here, the lift section allows you to control the darker parts of the image. If you hold down your left mouse button on this wheel looking bit at the bottom here and move this to the left, the darker areas get darker. 
And if you move it to the right, the darker areas get brighter. If you want to reset lift, click this little reset button here. Gamma can alter the middle section of the image or the middle brightness levels. Holding down this wheel and moving to the left darkens the image and moving it to the right makes the image brighter. You can just reset that. Gain allows you to control the brighter portions or the highlight. Once again, move this wheel to the right to make it brighter. Move it to the left to make it darker. Reset that. The offset wheel affects the entire image, so not just the darker or lighter parts. Left click and move to the right. This will brighten up the entire image and move it to the left to darken the image. Let's say for example here, we're going to move the offset to the right to brighten things up quite a lot. Then we'll use the lift wheel here to darken things down at the lower end. And then the gain here, maybe to lift the highlights even more. If you hit Control F, you can see a full screen view. And if you hit Escape, you can go back to this view. If you want to zoom in, hover over here and use your mouse wheel and hold down the mouse wheel to move around. You can see at the minute that we're getting quite a lot of bright highlights. So maybe we're just going to use the offset, left click, and then drag this down just to lower things a little bit. Hit Z to zoom back out. And let's say we're happy with the brightness. We can now click on this contrast node and either increase or decrease the contrast. There's lots of ways to do that. The simplest way is to use the contrast section here. You can either click on this and type in a value, let's say 1.5 to add quite a lot of contrast. And if you want to reset it, double click on the word contrast. You can also hold down the left mouse button and drag to the left to reduce the contrast or drag to the right to increase the contrast. Let's add quite a lot of contrast just so you can see what it's doing. We can now click on this third color node and inside here we can make some changes to the color. So you could use the temperature here and the tint here to correct any white balance problems. Just going to hold down the left mouse button and move this to the left to make things cooler and bluer. Or if you move it to the right, you can make things warmer. Let's just move towards the blue side a little bit in this image. You can do the same with tint, move it to the right to add magenta, move it to the left to add green. Once again, hit Control F to go full screen and we'll leave it there for now. If you want to increase the saturation in the image, you can use the saturation setting here. If I left click and move to the left, it's going to desaturate the image until we get black and white. And if I move it to the right past 50, it's going to increase the saturation until it looks horrible. To reset this, just double click the word sat. Let's just add a tiny bit of saturation just so you can see what it does. Another way to alter the colors is to hold down the mouse button on this middle dot in the offset and move this around to change all of the colors in the image. For example, if you wanted to cool it off, you could move it down to the bottom right here. I'll go a bit far just so you can see the effect. The final thing we need to do is actually export or render this timeline to a final video file that we can either give to the client or upload to YouTube. Let's see how to do that next. To export a video in DaVinci Resolve, click on the deliver button at the bottom right here to open up the delivery workspace. So there's a few different presets you can choose from at the top here. If you scroll across here, we've got presets for things like Twitter and YouTube. We've also got these other presets such as a H.265 master. You can go and create your own export or render presets, but if you're just starting out, it's probably better to use just one of the preset ones that come with DaVinci Resolve. So let's say, for example, we're going to export to YouTube. We can click the YouTube preset here. This drop down on the right of this icon allows you to choose a preset within the preset. Let's say we wanted to export this at 4K. The next thing we need to do is select a location where the file will be rendered to. To do that, click this browse button and then choose where you want to render it. Let's go in here and we'll create a new folder called render and then open that up. By default, we get this untitled file name. If you click save, notice that we get untitled at the top here. You can either click the browse button and change the file name here or change it in the file name section here. We'll just call this my first resolve vid. If you want to, you can change all of these settings, but like I said, you probably want to leave the defaults as they are when you're just getting started and then come down to the bottom here and click add to render queue. At the minute, we're not actually rendering anything. So if you're wondering where the video is, we have to actually tell Resolve to start rendering whatever's in the queue. On the right here, we can see this job that we just added. And to actually get this to render, come down and click this render all button. The timeline will now start to be rendered and you can see how long we've got remaining here and the progress bar. The amount of time it takes to render a video will depend on how long the timeline is, what kind of footage is within that timeline and also how powerful your computer is. So that's the render almost finished and now it's completed. 
So you can open up this location that you chose or to quickly get to it, right click on the job here and choose open file location. We can now see the rendered video that we just created here. So now you've got your final rendered video exported from your video editing software, you can go and upload it to YouTube. Before you do that though, you should watch the rendered video right from the start all the way through to the end, just to check that there's no mistakes or no rendering problems. All right, let's head into YouTube and we'll see how to upload a video. So once you've created your YouTube channel, come into YouTube Studio and come up to the top right and click the create button and then choose upload videos. You can then either drag a video from an explorer window onto this window or click this select files button. Head over to where your rendered video was output, click on it and select open. Your video will now start uploading and you can see at the bottom here we're currently uploading 0%. You can actually start to fill some of this stuff in before your video is finished uploading. For example we can type in a title, in this case it's a video about DaVinci Resolve color management and then you can give a description. I would advise you to go and create a custom thumbnail and if you do that you can click this button here and then navigate to where your thumbnail design is and then if you've got any playlists you can use this drop down here to add them to a playlist. For example in this case we're going to add it to this playlist and click done. Having all your videos in a playlist can make it really easy for viewers to find the content that they want. Make your copper declaration here, in this case it's not made for kids, and then click the show more button. Scroll down and then you've got a load of other options. This video didn't contain a product placement sponsorship or endorsement so I'm not going to tick the paid promotion tick box. And if you want YouTube to automatically add chapters and key moments you can keep this box ticked but if you don't you can untick it. You can allow YouTube to try and find automatic places in your video if you don't want that, untick this and then add one or more tags. Click on this box and then add tags to help viewers find your video. Notice this bit here where YouTube is telling us that tags play a minimal role in helping viewers find your video, but you still might like to go and fill them out anyway. I'm not going to go through each of these options. Just because you tick this box, there's no 100% guarantee that your subscribers are going to receive a notification though. If you want to allow other people to remix your videos into shorts, you can select these two options. Or if you don't want to allow other people to make use of your content, choose that option. You can now select a category for your video. There's loads of categories here. In this case, I'm going to leave it as education. I'm not going to select an academic system because it doesn't make sense for this video. And then you can also optionally select a type and also a level. In this case, we'll select beginner. If we scroll down here, you can also choose to allow all comments, to allow potentially inappropriate comments like swear words and other things, hold all comments until you approve them, or disable comments for the entire video. I normally leave it as this option. You can also choose how you want your comments sorted and whether or not to show how many viewers like the video. Once you've done that, click next. And if you're part of the YouTube Partner Program, you can select whether or not you want to monetize this video. In this case, let's turn monetization on and click done. You might not see this screen if you're not monetized yet. Click next. And now you have to make this ad suitability questionnaire rating. Just going to scroll down the bottom here. You wanna make sure that you answer this correctly. I know in this case that none of the above apply. So I'm gonna click that checkbox and click submit rating. You can see down the bottom here that this video is still uploading in the background. We've got nine minutes left. I'm just gonna click next. Now, if you want to, you can add a number of different video elements. If you want to, you can go and add different subtitles by clicking the add button. I'm not going to do that here, so I'm just going to hit the close button. And you can also add an end screen. These are little cards that appear at the end of your video to help drive the viewer to different content. Click the add button to add an end screen. Because the video is not completely uploaded yet, we're not going to be able to do this. So I'm just going to hit discard changes and wait until the video finishes upload. So now you can see that the video upload is complete. Now YouTube is going to process the uploaded video into all of the different resolutions. This was uploaded as a 4K video. And you can see down here, it's gonna take another 70 minutes for YouTube to process that 4K resolution. If you hover over this 4K icon, you can also see that to process the standard definition version is going to be 10 minutes, the HD version 45 and the 4K 70 minutes. So we'll just wait around until the SD version is finished and then we'll go and add an end screen element. So now you can see the SD resolution is complete. We'll go and click the add end screen button and this time we should see the actual video load down the bottom which we do. To add an end screen element click the little plus button up here and then choose the type of element. You can add videos, playlists, subscribe buttons, channels and external links if you meet the requirements. In this case we'll choose video and now you get to automatically add a most recent upload, allow YouTube to choose the best for the video, or if you want to direct them to a specific video, choose this button and then choose a video. So for example, let's choose this video. And now you can see the icon of the video here. You can move this around the screen and down here, you can also choose where that end screen element appears. Click save. And now you can see this green tick mark here telling us that we've added an end screen. Click next. See if there's any problems with the video. We've got two green tick marks here, so that's good. Click next. And then choose to either publish the video straight away, keep it unlisted, or schedule it for a specific time and date. 
once your video is published to the world, you can use the analytics in YouTube Studio to see how your video is doing. Don't forget though, you can always change the thumbnail and also change the title and description to see if that will help your video do even better. I'm Jason Roberts. This channel is all about making better looking, better sounding and better edited video. If that's something that will be useful to you, please, please subscribe. I'd really appreciate it and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.